This was the picture Danny Cotton took shortly after arriving at Grenfell Tower at around 2.50am on the 14th of June. Giving evidence today, she said she'd never seen anything like it and knew straight away it was an unfightable fire. I was not at any point thinking that we were going to be able to extinguish the fire and it was how best we were going to be able to try and make efforts to get into the building to rescue as many people as possible. From the outset, counsel for the inquiry pushed the commissioner on how prepared she and her officers were for the nature of the fire at Grenfell. Can you remember, what was the last training you received on incident operational firefighting before the Grenfell Tower fire? So I haven't actually received training for a while because in the role I uh, am in now, what I have done mainly is to undertake operational assessments. Did you ever receive training on how to spot and handle fire spread over the facade of a high-rise residential block? No, not on high-rise residential block. Does it follow from that that you've never received any training on cladding and fire spread up, round or down cladding? No, not to do cladding. Does it also follow that, therefore, you've never received training on the particular dangers that cladding poses? No. Or how to respond? No, I haven't. The thrust of much of the questioning today was about what the fire brigade knew or should have known about the potential risks of cladding in fires before Grenfell. Counsel to the inquiry said the London Fire Brigade had an institutional knowledge of those risks by 2017. The question is, why weren't firefighters given adequate training to deal with them? In the early days after the fire, the commissioner made clear it took hold in the tower in a way her officers had never seen nor anticipated, something she repeated many times today, adding that specific training would not have helped them put out the fire. We've been told by senior officers, I think as late as this week, that an operational firefighter would always expect the unexpected. Was this not the unexpected which you should be expecting? We learn from every operational incident, but in the same manner that I wouldn't develop a training package for uh, a space shuttle to land on the Shard, you know, we would respond to it and deal with it in the same professional manner we do. That is an incident of that scale. So I wouldn't expect us to be developing training or response to something that simply shouldn't happen. From the very beginning, one of the most difficult questions for the fire brigade was their stay put policy. Some of the families claimed it cost the lives of their loved ones. As the session came to an end today, the commissioner once again defended that policy and said she wouldn't do anything differently were she to face that terrible night again. Are there any particular lessons that you've learned from your experience of the night that would enable the decision to revoke the stay put to be taken earlier? No, I don't think so. If there was one aspect of the London Fire Brigade's response to the fire that you could go back and change, what would it be? I wouldn't change anything we did on the night. I think, uh, without exception, my firefighters, my officers and my control staff performed in a fantastic way, given the incredible circumstances they were faced against. They were put into an untenable situation in a building that behaved in a way it should never have done, that put the residents' lives at risk. And without a shadow of a doubt, uh, I personally was responsible for committing my firefighters to their potential death in the pursuit of rescuing as many people in that building as possible. For many of the families, this was a surprising admission, but a hugely disappointing one too. Tiago Alves escaped from the 13th floor with his parents and young sister. You know, it's extremely heartbreaking for all of us to know that she doesn't feel like anything was done wrong that night. And we do understand that it wasn't the London Fire Brigade who wrapped that tower in petroleum. But at the same time, it's extremely important for the London Fire Brigade seniors to understand that it is in acknowledging their failures that they can learn. And now it's extremely important to also understand that a lot of the firefighters did save lives that night but we can't forget that the 72 people did lose their lives. What we want to do is uncover the truth so that you know it's very difficult to talk about getting justice without actually looking and fighting for the truth. And what we would have hoped was Danny Cotton today to have been more open, truthful and transparent. The survivors and the bereaved will start giving their evidence to the inquiry next week. With me now, Antonio Roncalato, who lived on the 10th floor and was the penultimate person to be rescued that terrible night, and also by Matt Rack from the Fire Brigades Union. I suppose 
Foreseeability is the first question which, which certainly dominated today's evidence. The extent to which either you and your members or the authorities had any sense that something like this could happen? I think that that's one of the key questions that the inquiry has got to grapple with, foreseeability. And I think that's a debate. Uh, we believe that there were warnings given about cladding. We gave warnings as long as I was 1999 after a fire in Scotland about cladding and the risk of external fire spread. I think one of the problems for us is that the, the structures that existed from 1947 until 2004, which were in place to look at fire policy nationally, were all scrapped. So I don't think this is a London Fire Brigade issue. I think this is a national issue because there are f over 400 buildings with cladding on still. Uh, so that's a national issue about how we address that, either by removing the cladding, which we think should happen, or by discussing issues such as evacuation, such as how you fight fires in those circumstances. That's a national matter. What do you make of the Fire Commissioner saying that she wouldn't have done anything any different on the night? Well, I, I think that clearly lesson, it, lessons need to be applied, uh, and uh, I think the evidence of firefighters throughout the uh, weeks has shown that uh, there were problems, there were communications problems, so th clearly there's a lot of things that have to change as a result of this, and therefore things would be done differently. I think what did emerge from her evidence is there's a tremendous tension between the concern and uh, sort of protection of her own workers who were in terrible risk and in a, in a terrible emotional state, some of them. Yeah. And of course, the, the suffering people in the tower. She had difficult choices. I think there are difficult choices at all emergency incidents. I, I, my view is that all the firefighters, from the, the firefighters to those in charge, were in an impossible position because nobody had planned for that sort of fire on that scale. And so people were effectively making it up as they went along. Uh, and, and the issue I think now is, could people have planned better? And what are we doing now to plan better? Antonio, do you feel that questions you have always had are now being answered? Um, not yet. Um, we are still waiting for, um, you know, uh, for instance, on that night, uh, why was not the, um, the policy of you know, evacuating straight away, why the, the fire was still at a young stage, basically? Uh, to me, this is very important because if they had seen how unprecedented, but how quickly the, fr the fire was spreading, the priority to me and to many residents would have been evacuate now, evacuate now, and then concentrate on the fire and call for more support. Well, that has been the absolute essence of the debate. Do you say stay or go? And th th we've heard arguments both ways. W where does it stand as a, as a result of the evidence so far? Well, I think we, we've heard firefighter evidence. We heard the expert witnesses that, who, who uh, assess the fire protection in the building. They will be coming back. Uh, to, to resubmit evidence after they've heard now heard the firefighter evidence. I think that will give us a better picture of at what point smoke travel made it untenable for people to be on the stairs, because these are all factors about whether people could evacuate down the stairs. I think a lot of people will be worried that, 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 that there's now a year gone and there should presumably have been changes of practices and instructions and that issue of whether you should stay or go I mean, is it happening? Are your members, for example, in the Fire Brigades unit, are you being told what's new and what's changed and how you're going to tackle tower fires? I don't think there's been a great deal of change in terms of operational procedures. There have been changes in the London Fire Brigade about the response to tower, bo tower block fires, which we welcome, so they, there is an improved attendance to tower block fires in London. But if you look nationally, there is no single picture. We have a, a completely fragmented approach to mm. how we tackle fires and how we tackle tower block fires. I mean, you must be concerned. I mean, you, you, you're out of the tower and obviously that's a, that's a fact, but you must be concerned that there are people living in towers absolutely, just as absolutely. you were. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've been discussing this for many, many, many months already. So what are we waiting for? What are they waiting for? So many consultations, so many, uh, we're gonna put it a debate, but we have to act now. Um, because it, has, it, it was so unprecedented, it has happened once and so tragically. It can happen again. It could be Grenfell too can be on the, in the post again. So what are we waiting for? They have to act now. We're a year on. You're giving evidence on Wednesday. Now, that, 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 do you feel confident of the process that's going on? Well, I want to feel confident. I want to feel that uh, I want to give my contribution. I want to whatever... Uh, um, um, proof I have and with other many residents we want to you know to to give it and to to, to show to the world basically what has happened on that night 
And um, yes, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the truth comes out. And, uh, and on another note, if I may say also, is that, uh, you know, the place where the public inquiries is held, um, many residents, we're not very happy. Mm. It is not our location. It should be in this area. Uh, where it, the... It's right over in the uh, law courts. Where is that? Well, it, Holborn. Holborn. It's in yes, Holborn, in Holborn, yeah. yes. It should be in, in Kensington and Chelsea, where the pen portrait took place uh, a few months ago, and the residents were very happy to join there. And, uh, and this is basically something that we have expressed, but we've never been, there's never been, the answer was always no, but without any reason. Well, th this is obviously a moment for, for catching up, and the question is whether your members, who are after all have been giving evidence very extensively, are satisfied with the way this is going. I think uh, they members have found it a very, very painful process. Uh, I think there's been some improvements made. I think they're not, they're not used to giving evidence. They, they occasionally attend inquests, but never, n never done anything on this scale. And I think the tone of the questioning at times has been quite uh, aggressive. We felt. Uh, I think it's been harrowing. Aggressive from the lawyers or Sometimes, the judge? yes. At the, at the initial stage, I, think, that, I, think, I think that's improved. I think we have reserved in our position. We, we, I think we share some of the, the concerns that residents did. We, we, we said the residents needed to be at the heart of this. We think the inquiry could have been held over in, in, the, in the community. Uh, and I think for us, the question of the state of the building should have been dealt with in more detail before we got onto the fire, because before the fire happened, Lots of things had happened to that building that made it a death trap. Now, but there is good news to end on, isn't there? Absolutely, yes. Um, what has happened to you? Well, I have, uh, my son and myself, we have accepted a flat. Um, a so flat each? A flat each, yes, yes, yeah. yes. After so many uh, flats have been shown to us, and for various reasons we have to decline. So now, uh, you know, I got the feeling that this is the right one, a nice place that can become my home. So, and, very, very happy. And therefore, is that typical or are you exclusive? Um, I would say that the majority uh, of the residents that have accepted, they are very, very happy. But I believe that some, some others have accepted a little bit uh, too quickly, too rationally, and they should have uh, paused a little bit, think about it, and then say yes or no. And, but uh, at least one year on, you're getting there. Absolutely. And you're absolutely, happy on that. Absolutely. So I will, I'd agree. like to thank you both, both from the Fire Brigades Union, MacRac, and you, Antonio. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much thank you.